Nelly Campobello's Cartucho, first published in 1931, then in a much expanded new edition in 1940, is somewhere between novel, short story collection, anthropology, history, autobiography, memoir. In it, she combines her own memories of the Mexican Revolution, as she saw it, growing up during the 1910s, with stories she heard or collected from her mother and others. They're presented as a series of brief vignettes, few of which are more than a page or two long, that provide snapshots of heroes and villains, bravery and betrayal, shootouts and executions from one of the bloodiest periods of the uprising in and around her hometown of Paral in the northern state of Chihuahua. Paral was continually fought over by different factions within the revolutionary forces who turned on each other, settling scores with former allies and seeking to shape the nature of the regime that would emerge from the carnage. Campo Bello is an unabashed partisan of the losers in that struggle, Francisco Pancho Villa and his northern division, who had broken with Venustiano Carranza, President of Mexico from 1917 to 1920, when he in turn was turfed out of office and then assassinated. As the narrative of the revolution began to solidify in the 1920s and 1930s, Villa and his troops were often dismissed as little more than bloodthirsty bandits. Campbell Bayo's aim is to offer what in the book's epigraph she calls true stories of Villa, his men, and the fighting in northern Mexico, to offset the legends that merely repeat the victors' claims and dull the Mexican people's senses. But these are still stories, as Campo Bello validates tales told by those at the margins of official discourse, including women and even small children. They may not amount to a unified overall narrative, but they puncture pretensions to totality, the notion that we already know everything we need to know. Moreover, framing the revolution through the eyes of a child, Campo Bello restores the notion that there was something at stake in violence that could seem to be no more than a meaningless game. Perhaps, she suggests, at stake was the right to play. Campo Bello's text never aspires to unity or totality. Its fragmentary style ensures that there are no fixed beginnings. Instead, we're always in the thick of things, from the opening lines in which we're told that Cartucho didn't say his name, he didn't know how to sew or replace buttons, one day his shirts were brought to our house. Where Cartucho came from, we do not know. At other times we're told someone's hometown, Bustios had been born in San Pablo de Bayesa, but not what mobilized them, what led them to be passing through Paral in Villa's forces or wherever. Most often, a vignette opens with everything already set or in motion. They are on the corner of the second street. Tomas Ornelas was on his way from Juarez to Chihuahua. Paral was under siege. Nobody knew how they apprehended him. The reader and the narrator alike have to make sense of or respond to a situation not of their own making. Moreover, the connection between the different episodes is often unclear, and they frequently show signs that they are told out of order. For instance, a soldier named El Kirili crops up often. El Kirili and others were the one who were at the corner of Tita Alley, for instance, having at it with some carancistas. And yet his death has already been reported many pages earlier. They arrived and killed him right there in the river. It is as though the narrative looped round and about, or oscillated back and forth, following a logic dictated by memory rather than history. What counts is what sticks in the mind. 
I'll never forget as long as I live the fright that evil man gave me. I've never been able to forget the sound of the rifles as they made ready to fire. The people who saw Via's troop still remember the way it was. The memories of visceral imprints and scars that overlay each other, rather than obeying a precise order of context and causality. Similarly, one story leads to another via resonance, digression, or sheer circumstance. He tells the story at the drop of a hat, it is said of a tale told by the narrator's uncle, which features Pancho Villa himself, in which the hardened Caudillo shows a sentimental side when he has tears in his eyes. I know my uncle was surprised, and that's why he'll never forget the general's words, and neither will he forget his tears. These stories tell moments of intensity, flashes of affect, fear, surprise, amazement, joy, that shape or distort bodies and persist long beyond their immediate cause and effect. It is not that temporal markers are entirely absent. It is just that they do not pin the episodes down to any linear chronology, any overall narrative arc. It was ten o'clock at night. It was the 4th of September. But of what year? At any one moment, Pancho Villa's forces may be in town. But soon enough, we'll find ourselves among Carancistas, before the Villistas sweep back in again. In part, this simply reflects the historical experience of a town where the struggle for territorial control was especially hard fought. As the critic Max Parra notes, few towns during the revolution saw events as bloody as those that occurred in Hidalgo del Paral. In the course of ten years, Paral suffered the violence of being taken no fewer than twelve times by contending revolutionary forces. But it is perhaps precisely for this reason that broader historical narratives come to seem irrelevant, beside the point. This is not an experience that can easily be tidied up, whose events can be set in sequence and justified. In life, as in memory, what stands out are moments, details, that may be luminous or dark, tragic or even humorous whose significance is lost in their subsequent transcription into novelistic plots that have beginnings, middles, and ends. There are, however, endings, of course. Men die. Over and over, men die. But often enough, the narrator does not inquire why, and when we are given reasons, they are as disparate and disordered as the ebb and flow of troops and weapons. He died for a kiss the officer gallantly awarded him. He just had the face of a man lulled by fate. He was dying for a cause different from the revolution. Even cause and effect are apparently inverted, as when one soldier is said to have embraced the bullets and held on to them, as though bodies drew bullets from guns. If there is any conclusion to the book as a whole, it is a counterfactual fantasy or wish. The final vignette portrays a Villista victory, the successful defense of regional autonomy. The people of our land had beaten the savages. Our street would be joyful once more. Yet in fact, of course, Villa was defeated, his men overpowered by the technological superiority of Carranza's forces. As Lucas Izquierdo notes of the Battle of Celaya, which took place in 1915, predictably, Villa's northern division was mown down by defensive machine gun and artillery fire. With tragic consequences for the attacking soldiers, the newly emergent, dehumanized discourse of defense through mechanized fire firepower clashed with the epic personal heroism of attack. 
Izquierdo goes on to observe that this transformation of warfare through the evolution of high repetition weaponry that fragmented the battlefield and produced a sensatory atmosphere new in its intensity echoes or even anticipates the emergence of a similarly brutal form of war many thousands of miles away in the trenches of Ypres and on the Somme or elsewhere along the Western Front of World War I. Campo Bello's prose both mimics that fragmentation and at the same time rescues something of what she saw as the heroic bravery and disdainfulness towards death evidenced by Villa's forces. Hence, though she mentions the retreat from Celaya and the internal divisions it provokes amongst Villa's dispirited generals, she ends the book nonetheless with a sense of victory and accomplishment that subsequent defeat will never quite erase from memory. In part, then, Campo Bello rewrites history to recreate and pay homage to those whom the revolution vanquished, and who then had the subsequent indignity of being portrayed as no more than bloodthirsty bandits by the revolution's own chroniclers. In part, she goes against history to suggest other ways of thinking about or recollecting the past, faithful more to memory and affect than to a narrative logic of cause and effect. Either way, her intent is underlined and reinforced by what is perhaps the most striking aspect of her account. The fact that the stories of revolution are here voiced or channeled through a child narrator, a young girl who is, because of her age and her gender, doubly displaced from any rationale that the violence that surrounds her might obey. My question, then, is to ask what are the effects of adopting this point of view? How do we see the revolution differently when we see it through the eyes of a child, of a young girl who is apparently more interested in dolls than ideology, who has barely graduated from her mother's knee? Pause the video and note down your reaction to and thoughts about this child persona. While you do that, I'll have a glass of Tzotol but I'll be right back. Whatever its effects, the adoption of a child narrative or anti-narrative voice is a conscious strategy, rather than simply the result of circumstance or biography. There's some dispute about Campo Bello's date of birth. She often put it as somewhere between 1909 and 1913, as though she had been born with the revolution itself, but records point to it being 1900 or 1901, which would make her a teenager, between 15 and 19 years old, at the time that she witnessed the events she describes. She therefore displaces her memories to a still younger version of herself, or to an idealized construction of herself for whom the events of the revolution would be among her very first lasting psychic impressions, a sort of screen memory for which everything that came before was just a blank. As Jorge Aguilar Mora notes, in Catucho, Campo Bello inhabits those memories and that childlike perspective. Rather than adopting the stance of an adult who remembered her childhood impressions and judged the characters and events of her past from a position of maturity, Campo Bello's language is that of a child who has remained faithful to her memory, who pours over her memory as though she were pouring over the present. Observing that the violence offered up corpses as what could seem like dolls to a child's eyes, Aguilar Mora then suggests that Campo Bello's choice to displace the perspective from which the past was experienced does not do that past an injustice. It did not destroy or falsify the way in which the dead 
were taken up as child's toys. On the contrary, it gave it a vital, internal, and more profound legitimacy. If anything, Campo Bayo suggests that only a child could see things as they really were, stripped of the moralizing or politicizing judgments that accompanied and overwrote the events themselves. Only a child could see, or see through, the games that the adults are playing. The language of play and games is everywhere in Cartuccio. Sometimes what is referenced are literally children's games, reminding us of the narrator's position and perspective. At the very outset, for instance, we find her playing under a table, while the soldier, Cartuccio, who gives his name to the book, comes to thank her mother for repairing his shirts. From this marginal position, neither fully part of the scene nor entirely absent from it, she ventures a comment that links money, memory, and laughter. Money sometimes makes people forget to laugh. It's not clear how the adults respond to what is something of a non sequitur. Even at this early stage of the book, connections and continuities are shaky or absent, in favour of discontinuities and overlapping fragments. But perhaps it helps to remind the soldier of the importance of play and affect. The next thing we know, Cartuccio is tearfully singing a love song. He said he was a Cartuccio because of a woman, and playing with the narrator's little sister, Gloria. He used to give her horseback rides up and down the street. Perhaps Gloria, on the back of her soldier who is playing at being a horse, is playing at being a soldier. Playing at war shades seamlessly into war itself as Cartuccio is still carrying Gloria when a firefight breaks out. He had already fired several volleys when they took her away from him. The bullets fly, but the children are still children, sometimes overlooked in the heat of the moment, sometimes catching the grown-ups' attention and allowing them to indulge their own childish fantasies, a little free play in the midst of such violence. Before long, it is clear that it's not just the children who are playing games. So, in the very next vignette, we're told of one Elias Acosta that, when he wanted to have fun, he practiced target shooting at the hats of men who walked by on the street. He never killed anybody. He was just playing, and no one got angry with him. This seems to suggest an opposition between having fun or just playing and the more serious business of fighting and killing. Yet this distinction is almost immediately undone, as we'd hear that he'd laugh when he thought, and he went off singing on the day he had hit his target. To celebrate, happy and drunk, he draws pictures of monkeys for the young girls, and also gave each of us a bullet from his pistol. Similarly, at almost the end of the book, but also what must have been the very outset of the revolution, back when it all began, Campo Bayo does not provide the year, but it was November 1910 that Guillermo Baca led the first attack on government-held Peral. When the rebels come through town, with the revolutionary cry and the tricolor flag, firing shots through all the cracks where there were rural police, their actions are indistinguishable from some kind of game. They seem to be playing on horseback, we're told, riding across the plazas, up to the hills, shouting and laughing. Those who witnessed the uprising say it didn't look like one. The revolution opens as play, accompanied by laughter, an exercise in freedom, in finding and aiming at the cracks or fissures in the edifice of the state. At times, the ways in which the narrator sees fighting as spectacle, grisly details as objects of curiosity, and even bodies or body parts as potential toys, can seem macabre and unsettling. 
I thought it was wonderful to see so many soldiers, the narrator tells us early on. Another time, during a skirmish. We girls were eager to see the men fall. My sister and I climbed up to peer out of a window, our eyes wide in anticipation. Looking around, we didn't see a single body, which we really regretted. Or in the vignette entitled General Sobraso's Guts, the narrator and her siblings, or friends, ask them soldiers, Hey, what's that pretty thing you're carrying? From up the street we've been able to see that there was something pretty and red in the basin. What attracts them turns out to be the viscera of a dead combatant, organs without a body. The soldiers taking these bloody innards to the cemetery expect the children to be shocked when they realize their mistake, that the pretty and red thing comes from an eviscerated corpse. But instead, the kids crowd up close to see them. They were all rolled together, together as if they had no end. Guts! How nice! Whose are they? We said, our curiosity showing in our eyes. In From a Window, the girls do manage to see a man killed, and his remains are left to rot in the street. Since he lay there for three nights, I became accustomed to seeing the scrawl of his body sleeping there, next to me. That dead man seemed mine. I liked to look at him, because I thought he was very afraid. When, finally, the corpse is removed, someone had stolen the timid dead man, the narrator tells us that I went to sleep, dreaming they would shoot someone else, and hoping it would be put next to my house. This childlike wonder does not preclude affect such as fear or grief, and indeed it is a form of affect itself, but nor does it shrink from the horror all around. Matter-of-factly, Campbell Bayor itemizes and examines the elements that compose the events and situations around her, to evaluate their uses, marvel at their splendors, and consider the rules that govern their often surprising disposition. Critic Christine Vandenberg go to some lengths both to bring out the theme of play in Campobello's text, and to explore the notion of warfare as play, in line with Dutch historian Johan Wiesinger's influential treatise Homo Ludens, from 1938, contemporaneous with Cartuccio. For Vandenberg, Campobello's vision of the revolution as game captures its archaic aspects. In Wiesinger's framework, unlike modern wars, which are inhuman and cause massive devastation. Primitive war is a part of civilization and can be considered in terms of its cultural function. This can explain the fact that the revolution in Campobello's texts is presented as a war that is profoundly human. In Campobello's later work, Vandenberg continues, there is also an alternative imaginary of the revolution represented as a failed attempt to change for the better the rules of the social and political game in Mexico. None of this is to say, then, that for Campo Bayo the revolution was trivial or unserious. On the contrary, she restores dignity to its fallen combatants, especially the Villistas, who embody an ideal of combat as an integral part of culture in its defense rather than as its antithesis and annihilation. And she restores the idea that something was truly at stake in a conflict that can otherwise appear so chaotic and disorderly. At its best, it was fought for the right to play, to laugh, to feel, to be free from constraint. Not that Campo Bello's child narrator ever says such things directly. Her memories are more immediate and tangible, clinging to the sensory impressions, sight, sound, smell, touch, of life in wartime, rather than to the justifications that surround them. 
I'm telling what impressed me most, no longer recalling any of the strange words or names I didn't understand. Overwhelmingly, however, there was also the sense that in a revolution, there's not just bodies that are felled, but with them a set of discourses that can simply no longer be spoken or heard. One man, before he is shot, cries out that a man who's going to die has a right to speak. But moments later, everyone turned their backs on the grey form left lying there, pressing into the ground the words they'd never let him say. Campo Bello's narrator, driven by curiosity and wonder, constantly returns to such grey forms, not so much to give them voice, as to register at least that the men they once were had lived, had struggled, and had died, had persisted in their being, until they could do so no more.